More importantly now, it comes to me to uh, introduce the uh, new uh, SIVA's lecture. And uh, I should mention what this is all about. The Mark and Susie Sievers Computational Neuroscience Initiative uh, will be supporting uh, this named lecture within the, the highball big brain context. And the, the vision of this, of this uh, donation is to support uh, brain research in silico. And as you can see from these bullet points, uh, the vision is very much aligned with uh, the kind of activities that uh, we're undertaking within Highball, using computational modeling strategies to understand the brain, bring together leading researchers in computational and brain science, <clears throat> train tomorrow's interdisciplinary computational brain researchers, build a world-class computational infrastructure to support the research, build multimodal databases of imaging, genomics, behavior, and biospecimen information, explore the mechanisms of brain development and brain disorders, foster open science principles of data and tool sharing, and develop international partnerships to advance this vision. So very much aligned with uh, the goals of, of the big brain highball community. And so this first lecture, uh, this lecture, uh, our speaker is Martin van den Heuvel, and I, I couldn't be more delighted that uh, we have someone of uh, Martin's stature to give this first Sievers lecture. Martin is a leader in uh, connectomics in health and disease. He, he introduced the concept of a, a rich club of highly connected hub nodes. Martin is an associate professor. He heads the connectomics lab within the larger complex traits genetics group at the Vrij University in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Martin did his PhD in artificial intelligence at the University of Utrecht in 2009 and has been at uh, Vrij University ever since. His interests are many, uh, all based around connectomics. The cross-disease connectomics, why do so many disorders involve some the same brain regions? The relationship between micro and macro scale levels of neural circuitry and health and disease, links between genetics and connectomics, and the, the connectivity commonalities and variation within and across species and as they subtend uh, brain evolution. Martin was the uh, 2013 winner of the Dutch Brain Trophy from the Dutch Brain Foundation. And uh, we are delighted that uh, he is our first SIVA speaker here today. Uh, over to you, Martin. Thanks, Alan, for uh, this, uh, this very nice uh, introduction. Um, make me blush a little bit, but the good thing is that you can't see this over Zoom. So, uh, but it's very well, uh, very, uh, well, very well appreciated. Actually, I was, I was telling Alan that uh, I, that sounds a little bit unfair because I actually remember that one of my first trips to abroad to a big science institute was actually to uh, the MNI, and uh, that that uh, that trip when I was a young student actually uh, uh, triggered me in. Uh, lured me, in, I would say, into uh, into M and I research. So, um, and here we are, I think, well, fifteen or twenty years later. So, it is it is my biggest honor to uh, to present here. And uh, today, actually, I thought, well, talking about highball and talking about big brain, I thought, well, perhaps um, people know me a little bit from the field of connectomics and network science. So, uh, today, actually, I want to take the opportunity to. Um, to discuss with you a particular interest on basically the next question, right? How does the connectome relate to all of the other levels of neuroscience? Uh, it, is, it is evident that uh, we have a huge, long and rich uh, tradition in the field of neuroscience to study the brain from all sorts of angles. Right? Uh, this ranges from uh, both uh, um, old school, but also very highly modern day uh, uh, lesion mapping, um, originally by really, really mapping lesions from patients and then looking uh, and mapping their, their um, uh, mapping how the lesions um, map to, uh, to changes to the behavior of the patient. But uh, nowadays we do this with a huge databases of, uh, of, of lesion mappings by means of stroke uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more data driven way. Uh, this also ranges from the field of cell histology. Again, this too, it has, a, it, has a, it has a traditional component, starting with the great inspiring work by Broadman and von Konemal and all of the people that made these beautiful atlases in the far back in the previous century, but also with the super high modern work. Uh, some of it we have clearly seen also today. 
This also ranges to functional mappings, right? Functional mappings on, on the level of the cell, but also functional mappings on the level of brain regions. And in the last 10 years, we have also seen uh, uh, an, a, 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 in the emergence of uh, genetic studies, right? What is the underlying genetic component? What is the genetic variation that leads to, uh, to brain variation? And how does that relate to behavior? So neuroscience has become this, by itself, this hugely multidisciplinary field. And uh, for that matter, we can actually study the brain from all these different perspectives. And uh, well, I think highball and the big brain, of course, is a, is a, one of the leading examples of how we can start combining all of these different levels of information uh, and integrate them. And that's actually the topic that I wanted to discuss today, uh, taking the opportunity to discuss about some multi-scale properties of the brain. And as I discussed, right, the brain in that sense is, is definitely not a unimodal system, but we can study it from multiple uh, angles, but we also have to realize that very likely it is indeed a system that is inherently multi-scale. It's not just that we study the brain at different levels, but it has all of these different aspects that in some way has to be integrated to each other. And I always like to compare that to something typical Dutch, right? Uh, which is riding a bike. So if you, if you have a simple bike, in this case a city bike, then well, obviously it consists out of all different components, right? So if you have to want to figure out what the bike does and how it works, well then the first thing you would do is make a list of the components, right? You will figure out which are the indiv individual parts of the bike. And then the second level would be, well then how do they collaborate to each other, right? What will be the, the interaction between the different elements? And in the field of network neuroscience, uh, this is actually mainly our role, right? And that's, I think, also one of the key goals of the field of connectomics, right? The, my, uh, my field and my interest, right? So how do all of these different components of the brain, brain regions, but also cells, how do they work together and form local circuitry and then together form this more complex system? But in a similar way, once in a while, it also requires to zoom in to single components and really, really, really figure out how this individual component works, right? Uh, for example, in this case, if we want to understand the bike, we need to once in a while zoom in on this, this really tiny small detail, in this case, the rear derailleur, and figure out how the rear derailleur works uh, and, 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 and figure out every one of these individual components. And this, this we could perhaps compare to people that work on the synapse, right? Uh, it's, it's a crucial element, evidently, uh, and we need to figure out every individual part of the uh, synapse, but just only looking at the synapse is likely not gonna tell us uh, in that sense, the bigger story. Because the thing is, we can understand the bike, but that's never the same way as figuring out how you could use the bike. These of course are two very strongly related concepts, but they are inherently different. Riding the bike is definitely not the same as knowing how the bike works. And for every one of you who have tried to learn to ride the bike, uh, this, is, this is very clear. So here too, I think in the field of neuroscience, uh, we, we tend to have, uh, including myself, right? Very often to have this super reductionist, this view and saying, you know what brain function in the end is, yeah, it has, it has to result from every one of the components. But to me, I think this is still uh, almost a philosophical, but still very open question about whether brain function in the end is really the same as um, just a collection of the individual parts. So I just want to make postpone here that this one is certainly not trivial. So then how do we understand? How can we even ever understand the brain? Well, how can we start understanding the brain? Well, most often we start with the most simplest model that we have. We, we start with a very tiny bike, a simple bike, right? Uh, and this could be our comparison to the animal model field. Uh, where it is crucial that we understand how these more simplistic systems work. In the field of connectomics, we're mostly using the, the uh, very often using the, the, uh, the connectome of the C. elegans worm, which is a complete mapping of the neuronal interactions between the neurons of the C. elegans, which only has 300 neurons compared to the billions of neurons that the human brain has. So these simpler toy models might help us to, to, to make the next step and hopefully one day start to understand the bigger system. But we also have to realize in that this fact that there is no such thing as the bike. Uh, there are 
in that sense, a wide variety of bikes, which all have their individual purpose. So there is a huge variation in bikes. We have racing bikes, we have mountain bikes, we have even electrical bikes, right? Which, which are some sort of advanced bikes in the sense that uh, they're augmented. So lots of variation of bikes with lots of therefore also variation in terms of function. And finally, if we ever want to be able to protect the brain or fix the brain or fix the bike or fix the damage that a bike can, can, can cause, we, we need to have a good understanding of how the fundamental elements of the bike work. So I hope that I have convinced you now that we, we do have all of these different levels of organization, but it is crucial that within the field of neuroscience, we not only uh, examine each one of these levels, but that we also aim to link all of these different levels together and figure out how they interact to each other, how perhaps we can reduce one level to another level. This could be, this, this is very likely uh, in, in, some, in, in, in some situations, this might be the case. But in a similar way, it is also, uh, it might also well be that some of them cannot be reduced from one level to another, but they are like really in sync or uh, they have a strong uh, in interconnection to each other. And that together forms uh, some of the complex behavior that, uh, that we, in the end, can link to behavior and cognition. So I therefore argue that understanding the relationship between those uh, organizational layers, these scales of brain organization is going to be crucial if we ever want to have an understanding of the overall workings of the brain. Uh, but also uh, in the end, which is I think one of my personal interests is how we can get an understanding of how certain mental disorders and neurological disorders can emerge from changes to underlying brain structure. So what do we need for this multi-skill neuroscience or uh, if we focus a little bit on multi-skill psychiatry, which, which I will talk about uh, later on. What do, what do we really need? What will be our checklist that we minimally need to uh, perform such research? Well, the first thing, we need multi-skill data sets. It's a, perhaps a little bit of a trivial one, but of course we need data which can tell us something about multiple skills. Ideally, if we have multiple individuals, then hopefully we would have measurements of multiple skills in each one of the individuals. So then we could indeed uh, find cross relationships. The second thing we need is we, if we want to reach the entire skill, right? uh, I think nowadays there is no data set that, that has information from the same individuals or the same group of individuals from all of these different levels. So if we really want to build the entire skill, then in some way we need overlapping data sets that we can then stitch together to hopefully get a, a, a bigger, uh, bigger picture. And I will also, uh, in the next few slides, I will give you a few examples of these. And finally, a topic that I also want to discuss is that I think that we also need new methods. Uh, we have already seen, I think today, some clear examples that uh, bridging these skills, right, going from uh, uh, the, the, the small micron resolution to the, to the more whole brain, it's, it's not something trivial. So along the way, people uh, in all different groups uh, are developing new methodology to making this happen. But I also want to argue that once in a while, we also need new statistical methods. So perhaps because the, 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 if, we, if we look for relationships and we look for associations, then um, we also need the statistical tools and the null models to, to test out which effects are actually going beyond chance. And this, this again, is also not trivial. It is definitely a, a, a work in progress as, as we will also see. Um, uh, and I will also mention a few examples of these. So let's take a... Let's take a look and celebrate, I think, some of the examples that we've seen in the last five to 10 years on this multi-skill initiative that we see in the field. This, this growing interest of research groups that try to go beyond their, um, their individual level, which most of them, most of us are actually are trained to do, right? I, I was trained to, to work on the MRI level. So when I started to get interest in the cellular level, people said, you know, no, no, you're an MRI, right? So why would you show interest in this field uh, and it, it was even stronger when I also showed, said, you know what, we should also do genetics, right? Is there, is there some way of, to combine all of these different skills? But in the last decade, there's been certainly not something that was only to my interest, but it is great to see that it has a wide, uh, a growing support in the field to start bridging all of these different skills. So let's take a look at a few of these great examples. Well, one of them to start with, of course, is the big brain. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not just put this slide in here because, um, uh, this was the Sievers lecture. I actually use this slide quite often to, um, 
to discuss also with my students uh, the need and the, 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 the big efforts that, that uh, groups in the, and, and, and construction in the world are doing to actually start building these multi-skill data sets. Other great examples, uh, which I think definitely should be mentioned here, and, and this is definitely not exhaustive, right? So I apologize if your favorite data set is not on this slide. Uh, and, and please feel free to email me and say, no, no, I, I really, I really th should think that you put this data set on this slide as well. But great examples are things like the UK Biobank, right? Which nowadays has, I think, 40,000 MRI data sets with a huge mapping of all sorts of behavior, disease, but also uh, genetics, and in the future, hopefully other types of measurements like proteomics and, and uh, transcriptomics. So this too is a, is a, is a well, you're familiar with this, right? It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful data set to, um, to start working on multi-scale relationships. Another great example is, of course, the Allen Brain Atlas. I, I showed you a picture of the mouse brain, but it's also, they have a, a fantastic data set on transcriptomic data of the, the human cortex, which is brilliant and, and uh, superly used in the field. Other uh, data sets are things like uh, the ACP, the Human Connectome Project, uh, which already started, I think, 10 years ago, but has, has greatly catalyzed the field of multi-scale and in particular multidimensional connectomics of integrating structure and function. Uh, and also the, the Psyden Code uh, initiative is a fantastic initiative that, that uh, provides cross-species data in terms of both MRI uh, as well as um, all sorts of transcriptomic data. So here too, there is, there is this growing interest in this case of how potentially cross-species cross re relationships uh, might provide a, a fundamental new resource to get a better understanding of uh, mental disorders. And uh, this is definitely something also that my lab has an interest in, in, in how we can build relationships across species and get a better understanding of the emergence of human specific type of uh, mental, mental conditions. And these data sets, right? They, like I said, they have fueled fantastic new uh, discoveries. Uh, this was a, a, a paper by Rory and colleagues uh, very recently in which they showed that uh, there are Milo uh, uh, gradients, Milo architectural, architectural gradients uh, within uh, individual uh, um, um, as we previously believed, somewhat homogeneous regions, but apparently they're not homogeneous, they're very heterogeneous. And uh, these high resolution data sets, they can give us information about gradients within structures and also uh, showing that these gradients actually relate to uh, intrinsic functional connectivity differences uh, and gradients within uh, functional connections of these areas. So ourselves too, we have um, used extensively the big brain data set. Uh, and one of the studies that we did here was uh, to link how potentially the higher resolution, super resolution uh, of the big brain images, uh, and, and, and particularly if we could zoom into the almost cellular and cortical level, how that might relate to the overall organization and architecture of the connectome. So in this case, basically, this is a small pipeline that we, uh, we used back then. Basically, we used the big brain data to to, um, to define the, uh, the cortical profile. So this is the profile from, um, from, the, um, from the outer sheet to the inner sheet. We, we defined the cortical profile across the cortex. So this gives us an indication of a little bit of the cytoarchitecture architecture of the brain region. And then we noticed that if, we do, if you do that for thousands and thousands of different areas of the brain, then you can of course compute a similarity matrix of the profile of one uh, area of the brain and another area of the brain. And this, of course, will result in a similarity matrix. And in the same way, we can make a connectivity matrix based on fiber tracking, right? which we were very used to do uh, by means of uh, connectomics. And interestingly, what, we've, what, what we found, if you, if you then compare these two uh, matrices, both giving us different information of, of connectivity or, um, 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 yeah, linking properties of the brain, I would say, then uh, these, are, these are definitely not different. Uh, they are actually highly overlapping, right? They show a clear shared structure, if you will, in terms of um, uh, of brain regions that are more connected and stronger connected in terms of their anatomical connections over means of the wide matter tracks. These regions also have, and not just only adjacent regions, but also on a longer distance, they share cytoarchitectonic uh, features. And even more, we could also show that some of the network properties that we so uh, often ex uh, are, and, and, and we're keen on to examine things like the clustering, but also things of, of uh, degree, uh, which is an important ingredient for uh, a rich cup structure, that these two uh, were actually embedded 
in the underlying cyto architectural organization uh, of the cortex. So this, this for us was a, 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 uh, uh, a, a sword with two sides, right? And on one end, it, will sh it showed us that, uh, uh, it, it was a little bit of a validation that some of the connectome reconstructions that we do uh, with techniques like diffusion MRI, which, which definitely have their issues on their own, actually shows strong overlap to uh, measurements um, obtained from non-MRI, in this case, uh, similarity structure by means of uh, the big brain data. And the other thing uh, was that actually the metrics that we are so keen on examining, the ones like uh, the, the network architectural features, which define the topology, like the rich glob, like the degree, uh, are actually features that, again, are strongly embedded, potentially uh, already deep in, in the much more uh, microscale architecture of the brain. And um, other great examples, uh, which, which I'm sure that this audience is very familiar to, are, are initiatives like the, the Ulich brain here too, right? Yeah, the, the goal here is to provide some sort of a high resolution um, uh, whole brain mapping uh, of cyto architecture. And this too, I, I, I bet you it will, be, uh, it will be a heavily used resource in the future, uh, but also now actually, um, to, to map that to other fields like, uh, like quantumics. So uh, ourselves, we too, we, we had a, we always have a, had a, a great interest in in, uh, in in old atlases, if you will, atlases from 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 uh, previous cytoarchitectonic mappings. Um, as I discussed, the Big Brain project fueled many of our interests of trying to find um, uh, to what extent the more mathematical structures of the connectome, again the degree, the clustering, the modules, to what extent they actually do, uh, to to what extent are they embedded in the uh, in the cellular architecture of the brain. So, uh, actually, recently we published. Uh, this is a this is work by one of my students, uh, Rory Beinerberg, who published um, who manually segmented uh, uh, some of the uh, classical atlases that uh, has been presented uh, far deep in the previous century. The maps of of uh, Campbell, Broadman, uh, those are might be very familiar to you, but uh, there are also other super uh, super pioneers like von Economo and Koskinas. Who, um, who very extensively uh, performed uh, cytoarchitectonic mapping of the cortex. So basically, we, we implemented all of these atlases into MRI space, um, including also some functional atlases, the one of Kleist, which is a, a traditional, uh, I think, World War I uh, lesion mapping atlas uh, relating to behavior. So we, we made them available basically for the MRI community to be easily uh, used, hopefully, for, for example, reconstruction of networks and then it might be much be easier to link these cytoarchitectonic features to um, to features on the uh, on the more much more macro scale, both in terms of structural connectivity and functional connectivity. And these these maps are freely available. You can easily download them and implement them in your uh, in any toolbox that you um, you're so keen on. And uh, we, we we don't only cover in that sense uh, human atlases, but we have also uh, did a few projects in implementing our previous uh, macaque, but also chimpanzee atlases. So, so far, right? I think hopefully uh, we we have we have we have seen, and hopefully I've convinced you that there are some great examples of the feasibility and the importance of linking features of cyto architecture to uh, to microscale connectivity, right? Both on the structural level and as well as on the functional level, uh, in terms of of network systems like the default one network and the visual network and what network have you. So let's also take a look at perhaps one level deeper, right? Is there also a way that we can direct, directly link neuronal properties to uh, microscale connectivity properties? Uh, and, and here too, there, there is, if you just go into literature and, and, and you're, you have an interest in, in other fields of science beyond your own, uh, the field that you're trained in, right? Uh, then you will discover that there's, there, there's a lot of theories that are overlapping, um, even certainly across different fields, right? And one of them, for example, is the, uh, and this is, this, this again is pretty old data uh, in which people notice that if you just go from uh, unimodal to much more heteromodal and even in the end association regions that if you look at the, uh, the pyramidal neurons, uh, in particular, in, in this case, layer three pyramidal neurons, uh, they, they show a certain level of gradient in terms of their uh, level of complexity. So basically put, right? If you look at la layer three pyramidal neurons in V1, uh, they're pretty, they're relatively, well, simple. Right? Uh, 
So that means that they have a, a the genetic branching is not super complex. Uh, the, the, the neurons are generally small. Uh, they have they have a certain number of synapses. But if you start comparing that to much more uh, higher order regions, uh, MT, but also you go up and up in the parietal cortex, and in the end you end up in the frontal cortex, which generally believed to be association cortex and involved in much more higher order processing then the neurons start to become bigger, more complex in terms of their branching. So they have, they're not just only bigger, but also they're, uh, they have many more branches uh, and also their synaptical density starts to increase. So basically the bigger you go into some sort of a gradient in terms of hierarchy in neuronal organization, uh, uh, the, the, the neuronal, um, sorry, in hierarchy in terms of function, you also start to see this similar gradient, uh, this co-patterning of gradient in terms of neuronal, uh, neuronal complexity. And the same type of theory, right, we discussed a couple of years ago in terms of microscale connectivity, that if you look at, at regions that have relatively on, on the purely microscale regions, right, so if you uh, microscale level, so if you look at regions and you simply count their number of connections that they have with other brain regions, uh, and this we did with DTI, diffusion MRI, but also with track tracing and all sorts of other uh, fancy methods that you have, so basically what, what, what we tended to see is that you have regions that are relatively low in terms of function or, or unimodal. Uh, so they have tend to have less connections, microscale wide, than a regions that are classically defined as association areas or heteromodal um, and multimodal brain areas. So here too, we tend to see this, this gradient in terms of microscale connectivity. Uh, but now uh, completely seen uh, at a completely different level of brain organization. Right? On one end, the cellular level, on the other end, much more region to region level. So we started, we, we thought, well, is, we, we, we tend to see this, but can we also test this, right? Is this, is this really something that is real or is this something just simply in the eye of the beholder? So basically what we started to do, we started to collate all of the data that was published uh, in various different uh, uh, papers on uh, reports on, on cellular organization, in partic particularly layer three pyramidal neuron complexity, uh, in this case in the macaque cortex. And this is a lot of pioneering work done by Elston and colleagues and, and several other, uh, other people, but Elston did, did an immense amount of work and uh, filled our database um, for, for a large bit. So basically we used all of this data and then from that on we were able to reconstruct layer three pyramidal complexity of around 60% of the areas of the macaque cortex. And then we said, you know what, we can use the same brain regions and then use a resource, a fantastic resource like Cocomac, but we also use the fantastic uh, Markov data set of uh, much more, uh, more fine-grained uh, track tracing. Um, so we use these databases to reconstruct also the connectome the microscale connectome on, uh, on, on the much more microscale level. So right, this will be region to region uh, connectivity. So, uh, and the connectivity matrix, right? Uh, I, I, I assume that for many of you, this is, this is uh, very clear, but it basically it describes the, uh, all of the different brain regions in the rows and the columns. And whenever you see a connection, uh, there is a dot in the matrix. So this of course allows you to give, to, to extract the number of regions both in this case in degree and as well as out degree, so the number of afferent as well as efferent connections uh, of each, each one of the brain regions, uh, which we, from this we could extract something like microscale degree. So suddenly we had of the same brain regions, we had very detailed information about the cellular uh, complexity as well as much more on the microscale level of connectivity. When we started to uh, look for association between, this, uh, uh, between these features, uh, we found a lot of them. So basically, um, to, to, to make the long story short, uh, we found this, this strong association across cortical areas of the gradient in terms of growing complexity in the cellular organization to coexist with the strong gradient in terms of also the microscale organization. So regions with a strong level of uh, pyramidal complexity were also those regions that have many more um, uh, outgoing uh, connections as compared to, um, to, to much more unimodal regions. So this suggests there's indeed a strong level of, of coexistence between one level of scale and one level of gradient in the cortex uh, and a completely different types of level of organization at another scale. 
And when we when we when we uh, when we looked a little bit closer and, and deeper into this data set, we, we we could also validate. I think some of the theories that, uh, uh, in terms of the micro scale wiring proposed already back in the in the nineties. Uh, this is this is a, a fantastic diagram by Fellerman and von Essen, in which they aim to reconstruct the visual hierarchy in terms of uh, completely track tracing data. It's one of the first connecto maps, if you. Uh, if, you, if you use that terminology, I think already back in the 90s, even before we, we had the term connectome, they did all of the, 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 the pioneering work here. And interestingly, when we, when we use this visual hierarchy, right, we, we, we found this very nice correlation with the spine density of the, of the neurons of these individual regions. Again, suggesting that this hierarchy being defined in this case in terms of microscale organization is, is something real. It's not just something that we make up in terms of our mathematical tools, but it is in my, at least in my view, embedded in the cellular architecture of the brain. And also, the, in our case, uh, it, it was already introduced. We have a long history in, in, in looking for um, features that might bring integration uh, in the brain. And one of the things that we proposed here is the rich club organization in the brain, the, the tendency of, of the super rich in the brain, that the high degree regions to become richer and richer something that we tend to see also in other fields of, of science and, and society, um, unfortunately, uh, I think. But, uh, well, the risk of phenomena, right, that the rich get richer. And here too, we, 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 when we compared hub regions to uh, non-hub regions, it was clear that the hub regions tend to have longer trajectories. they had more spines, they, they, their spine density was higher, they also had higher metabolism. So in every aspect, they, they, were, they were richer in terms of at least the resources they, that they could use, uh, both on the neuronal scale, the micro scale, as well as on the much more micro scale. And these theories, right, of the strong link between on one end, uh, one end the, the micro scale features uh, or all the micro scale features to be embedded in the cellular architecture, that's that's definitely something that um, uh, we, we, we not only see in the macaque cortex, but it's something that, that is very cross-species uh, present. Uh, this is a great paper I found in, in Neuron in which they showed the similar feature in, um, in this case, in the, in the layer five pyramidal neurons uh, in, the, uh, in the, I think the red cortex. Uh, but there's, I definitely also have to mention the fantastic work by uh, Klaus Hilkertag in this context in which they showed a similar type of things in both the cat as well as the macaque cortex. So, so here clearly, right, again, there is strong evidence that the, the cellular architecture and the much more microscale architecture are, uh, are definitely not independent. And there, there are two, uh, two features of, of, of the brain, uh, two sides of the same coin. So we also, uh, of course, aim to validate this in the human brain. Uh, in the end, I think one of one of my goals of my lab is, of course, to to get a better understanding of uh, the emergence of uh, mental conditions. So, and for that, actually, in the end, you in some way, some you know, in some moment in time, you have to go to the human brain, of course. So, uh, here too, we basically we collate it as as much as we could data on layer three pyramidal complexity of the human brain. Uh, I was surprised actually to see that we might have missed a lot of papers, but I would have assumed that all of this data would be available, perhaps scattered across literature, but still available. But actually, we, we, we tend to have in neuroscience a very strong bias, if you will, to map a few brain regions. Right? Almost all of the papers, they used V1 as a control area. Many people, they, 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 uh, they tend to examine the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. But there are many areas of the brain which quantitative data on layer 3 pyramidal neurons seems not to be available, or, or at least we missed it. And if that's the case, then DM me now and, and let me know about, uh, about these data sets. But basically, when we, when we did, the same, did the same trick as in the, as in the macaque, basically, in this case, we now reconstructed the connectome, obviously not with track tracing, but with diffusion MRI, we, we found the same type of correlations, right? Again, the, the brain areas with a higher level of complexity, higher up in the, in the uh, hierarchy, if you will, in terms of information integration, the association cortex uh, had both higher degree in terms of microscope connectivity as well as in terms of spine density and, and temperature complexity. So this here clearly suggests that there is a strong link between on one end neuronal connectivity and on, on the other end connectivity in terms of the microscale. Um, so, but so far, we mostly talked about structure, right? So, of course, can we do the same thing when we study function? Well, here too, I think there is, there is some clear evidence. So, basically, in this 
uh, we, we did a study a couple of years ago in which we, uh, again, collated the fantastic data, in this case, uh, a paper by Kutter and colleagues, which comes from the, uh, from, from the famous uh, Zillis lab, uh, in which they uh, reported on neuroceptor density in the macaque cortex. So we collated again all of these data, we put it in the framework of which we could also reconstruct uh, a macroscale connectivity. Well, in this case, actually, we didn't use track tracing, but we used uh, strychnine based uh, mappings of uh, connectivity, which is perhaps an equivalent of some sort of forms of functional connectivity. It's, it's a very old, in that sense, again, back in the previous uh, century uh, method. Uh, which I don't think is used that much anymore, but it does give you information about whether one area actually has a functional uh, effect on other brain regions. Basically what they do, they, they put some stuff on the brain, which makes the local area super excitatory. And then the neurons that are in this area, all of their long range projections, they will, they will fire immensely. And basically then you measure with EEG uh, where in the brain region, uh, where, in, where in the brain there is activity. So with that, you can actually uh, um, or stimulate a brain area, perhaps an equivalent of modern day TMS, uh, and then you can look for where in the brain very precisely um, these connections project to. Um, so you get a con connectivity matrix out of this, but now some sort of a yeah, hybrid structural functional connectivity matrix, uh, but in that sense, less I think less prone to biases and errors that, that we tend to have in, uh, in when we use functional MRI. Uh, and then we, when we started to integrate these two data sets, right, we, we again found that uh, uh, there is a, a, a relationship between, on one end, in this case, the, the, the ratio between the neurotransmitters that were excitatory and the, the neurotransmitters that were inhibitory. And the ratio between them defined uh, to what extent a certain area of the brain uh, would have an intrinsic uh, or a normative um, excitatory character. And what we found is that the regions in the brain that tend to have more of this excitatory nature, they were also the regions that tend to have the highest functional outstrength. So later we validate this with fMRI and here too we found these correlations basically showing that again regions that have a strong uh, inherent uh, excitatory character tend to also be the regions that uh, in the resting state have the highest level of functional connectivity. So here too, this suggests that the, the resting state that we tend to normally measure with fMRI, things like the formal network, visual cortex, motor cortex, uh, might be uh, inherently embedded in, in, in basically in the, in the Lego building blocks of our brain, in this case, the level of neurotransmitters and the, the, the ratio between them uh, in each one of the brain regions. So these are not just only measurements of, of when the brain is, is functionally active, but likely something that is that is that is directly linked to the underlying uh in this case the the cellular or the neurotransmitter architecture the, the chemo architecture of the cortex and this too that has been has been noted not just only by my group but definitely across the field this is a beautiful paper by Gullis and colleagues um uh, very recently published in in, in pnas where they where they tend to show uh, in a similar way that there's transmitter receptor distribution in the human cortex is is uh, is certainly not uh, homogeneous uh, and that it has big consequences for the underlying cytoarchitecture. architecture with that arguably uh, the functional organization also on the macro scale level. So I think I have five or 10 minutes left, right? So I, I um, uh, in the next slides, I, I, I was hoping to discuss a little bit also some of the other links. So one of them uh, being of course, the link between genetics and connectivity. I think this, this again too is I think a very important level that uh, an interaction that we, we need to examine more and more. Uh, the first option, of course, would be to do and to use techniques like GWAS on, for example, functional connectivity or structural connectivity, and then examine the hits and then see how these hits might be enriched for certain uh, certain traits. Uh, and this is this is a great example by uh, I think one of the first studies that extensively did this uh, in, in great detail is a paper by uh, Nader Jahanshad from the uh, very famous uh, Thompson Group. And uh, Jahanshad and colleagues are there true pioneers in, in doing GWAS on, uh, on MRI data. And, and basically what in this, this paper, it was a small sample, well, big at that time, but nowadays we have samples that are 10 times as big. But what I find so fascinating about this study is that it's basically their approach. So what they did is they, they performed a GWAS analysis on all possible connections in the brain. At that time, super computational expensive. And then what they found is that they found certain hits 
in certain in some of these connections. And interestingly, the connection that they selected in this case, the one between uh, within the deformal network, was actually enriched for hits that were related to Alzheimer's disease. So this again shows that if you combine, in this case, genetics with much more marker skill connectivity, that this might give you a new glimpse or a new window of opportunity to get a better understanding of why certain areas might be uh, inherently vulnerable to certain processes, in this case, related to, uh, to AD. A second type of approach that uh, to link genetics to, uh, to neuroimaging is by means of using transcriptomic data. And this too has, has gained a lot of interest in the last few years. Uh, a typical pipeline is as follows. You, you take your, in this case, the LNU brain data, you put that into the framework uh, of which you can also uh, map, for example, connectivity. And then uh, because the LNU brain data covers the entire cortex, you, you can get per brain region, the same brain regions of which you have your MRI uh, metric or your EEG metric or your MEG metric, you have transcriptomic data, so the level of gene expression. And then of course, once you have that, you can start combining these two and look for uh, enrichment of genes in terms of how, a, how their spatial pattern across the cortex might link to the same spatial pattern in terms of your uh, MRI metric. And there's been great examples of the usability of this. Uh, there, there was the, the Krina paper, which is probably one of the first to show that the different functional networks like the formal network, visual cortex, motor network, uh, they all tend to have a different uh, transcriptomic fingerprint. Um, uh, but there, there, are also, there are also, I think, great examples uh, in which people showed that um, uh, seed connectivity uh, approaches, again, like mapping single individual connections might also be related to uh, transcriptomic gradients in the cortex. Uh, and, and recently I found this, 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 when I started Googling for this lecture, I found this, this cool application actually of, of showing that um, uh, the, the, the effectiveness of certain drugs or medication, well, in this case drugs, but I, I assume you can use the same thing for medication, uh, might be uh, actually related to the underlying transcriptomic architecture, basically where certain genes uh, become expressed, that's where also where, of course, these drugs uh, might become more affected. Uh, so I think we'll see more of this, uh, this type of, uh, in this case, drug versus transcriptomic interaction across the pattern of the cortex uh, more in the upcoming years. Well, at least my group definitely has a, has a strong interest in this. So this also, of course, brings the question of then, is there some way that we can also indeed use that to give a give a better better understanding of the origin uh, origin of uh, psychiatric and neurological conditions, and well, indeed, traditionally here too, uh, there has been uh, if you, if you take for example a disorder like schizophrenia, uh, there has been reports of almost every one of these individual levels to be uh, to be involved. Right, obviously at the genetic level. It's clear that uh, schizophrenia has a strong genetic uh, disorder, super high heritability, uh, but uh, large uh, and growing GWAS studies uh, also um, uh, tend to show more and more hits related to, um, to genetic risk factors or genetic risk genes and SNPs related to the, to the condition. But also at the neuronal level, uh, there has been, I think, ample evidence that uh, um, uh, there, is, uh, there are strong changes uh, at, the, at the cellular and, and in particular at the spine density level. Uh, work by Lewis and Kaluri and colleagues who have clearly shown that uh, schizophrenia patients, in particular in association regions, tend to have uh, layer three pyramidal neurons uh, with, with lower level of connectivity in terms of their spine density. But also at the microscale level, uh, the MRI field, uh, people have clearly shown there is reduction in cortical thickness, uh, but also at the level of, of connectomics, uh, people have, have shown that there are changes in the, in the connective structure and connectivity structure in patients with schizophrenia, both on the structural level as well as on the functional level. So one of the studies we, we did in terms of our multi-skill interest was to see whether uh, here too, these, as we've seen a normal relationship in terms of micro and macro and cellular and macro skill connectivity, is it also the case that changes in one level are related to changes uh, and in particular, the extent of the changes that we see uh, at, the, at, an, at another uh, level of scale of organization of the brain. So basically, as we did for the, for the human sample, we collated as much as we could on quantitative measurements of layer three pyramidal complexity in schizophrenia patients compared to healthy controls. So this would be a delta, right? A change in terms of their uh, 
um, spine density. And then we aim to link that to a change uh, that we could observe in terms of their uh, diffusion weighted uh, structural connectivity. And when we started to do so, and, and, and again here too, definitely no full coverage of the brain, unfortunately. Uh, again, there's a pretty strong bias in the field, I think of mapping only the regions that we already knew or, or hypothesized to be affected and uh, leaving behind, I think a lot of regions that we, we simply don't know whether, the, whether or not they are affected or not. But nevertheless, when collecting the data that we could have, we, and we, when we correlated that to the, to the, the gradient of connectivity in terms of microscale, here too we find this, this beautiful correlation uh, between the level of change in terms of sp spine density in patients with schizophrenia and the level of change that we could observe in terms of MRI in the long range projections of the cortex, right? And remember this one here is, is, is not related to the cortex itself. This is purely based on the, uh, the micro of the, the micro architecture uh, of, of the white matter connections. And we were, we were able to replicate this also in a separate cohort. Um, so basically, I think, I think these, this suggests that indeed mapping and linking one level to another level can not only tell us, I think, crucial information about the fundamental organization of the healthy brain, but can also help us to, to get a better understanding of how uh, and where certain processes in the brain uh, um, or might, 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 might make the brain vulnerable to, uh, to disease conditions. So I think, I think it's time to, to start wrapping up, um, but I want to end with some of the thoughts on uh, potential underlying um, reasons. Why, are, why is the micro and the micro scale level connected? Uh, and this is definitely something, this is, this is purely theory, right? But uh, I hope that uh, you guys will join the discussion later on and, and convince me that uh, I'm wrong uh, in, these, in this theory. So a couple of years ago, we did, we did a review uh, on, on potential micro micro scale relationships. And uh, we, 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 could come up, we came up with three possible organizational principles that might govern this, this relationship across scales. The first one is the notion of, are there potential fundamental building blocks in the brain? Are there some motifs in, in brain network organization I, which, which govern both the micro scale as well as the micro scale and perhaps also behavior? And interestingly, there are some examples of this, right? If you look at the gene level, the neuronal level, but also at the micro scale level, all of these, if you, if you use the same network tools, all of these, these tend to, to show, for example, hubs, right? Or tend to show the same level of modules. If you look at the gene to gene interaction, as well as to behavior to behavior, which is completely other end of the spectrum, there seems to be at least shared uh, underlying principles. So it could well be that there might indeed be fundamental building blocks in nature, if you will, that, that govern organization of complex systems, whether it is on one scale or the other. The other possibility, um, and it's, it's, I think it's not black or white, it should not be one or the other, I think, but one of the additional possibilities could be that micro shapes macro, uh, and perhaps also the other way around. And this is, this is I think, a, a theory uh, I think very nicely introduced by, um, again, the Hilkatak group who, 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 I think in one of the papers, they said like connect to like. So the cytoarchitecture uh, and cytoarchitectural similarity might, might help tracts of, uh, to perhaps grow between brain regions and as such, or, or basically to maintain connections between brain regions. And as such, that might, might be that uh, micro scale in that sense guides the micro scale organization of the, of the connectome. And a final theory or uh, additional possible axis of organization might be that there might be some sort of universal principles of complex organization that relates a little bit to the building blocks, but I think goes at least one level deeper. And this is something that actually we, we are working on uh, now. Uh, this is a paper um, uh, project done by Leonis Scholz, one of my postdocs in the lab. Uh, so in the last years, we've been working on uh, collecting uh, neuronal data across multiple brain regions and, and indeed uh, reconstructing as, as far as we could uh, layer three pyramidal complexity neurons, right? I started off by saying that I was quite surprised that this data was not there yet. So uh, in some way, we, we, we thought it would be a good idea. It wasn't, it was a lot of work, um, but she was at the working bench, not me, but uh, uh, to reconstruct all of these, these different brain reads. And so we basically, we upsampled, uh, upsampled the resolution that we, that we had previously and combined that with a lot of 
uh, new material. And basically then what we started to say is that we also have, so now we have the, like the digital reconstructions of these neurons. And uh, typically they're, they're examined by means of the Shaw analysis, right? Which gives you the information about the complexity. But in a similar way, we thought, well, we could also do the same thing on the DTI tracks that we reconstruct, right? So here too, we, we, we can use the DTI to reconstruct basically the connectivity tree. So we go beyond the idea of just yes or no connectivity, which would be a metric of degree. But here we basically looked for our, and reconstructed the entire tree of connectivity on the macro scale. And this too, we can, we can make subject to some sort of a Shaw analysis. So we basically implemented a macro scale score, uh, a Shaw analysis. And when we started to do so, right, again here too, we find that uh, some of these metrics that define complexity at the neuronal scale similarly define complexity at the much more macro scale. So here too, we find this very strong correlation uh, between those two completely different skills of organization. Uh, but um, if you just uh, take the same measurements in terms of complexity, uh, suddenly you see all of these different um, coexisting uh, gradients to emerge. Uh, so uh, yeah, the paper is on uh, by archive and uh, it's it's uh, like it's it's on a peer review, so uh, it's not uh, it's not true yet. I would say no. Okay. Um, so uh, I I hope that uh, by now I have convinced you that the brain is this multi skill system and that uh, well I, I don't I don't I, I don't think that I, I there was no need to convince you on that, but um, I, I hope that I, I I I we celebrate a little bit uh, projects like Big Brain. Uh, projects like Highball, uh, projects like uh, the ACP, uh, UKB, uh, which are fantastic data sets, in particular for people like me who are from the field of computational neuroscience, uh, to start building all of these bridges between those different fields. Uh, not just because we can, not just because we want to understand or reduce one level to the other, but fundamentally in my belief that these skills together uh, define the complexity of the brain. And, and that if we ever want to understand the brain, we can never ever uh, do that by just only examining one level. So uh, again, thank you very much for your attention and I hope we still have quite a time for questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Martin. That was a breathtaking uh, journey through so many wonderful new ideas related to the interaction between genomics, connectivity and behavior. Um, I'm sure there are many questions. So. Anybody want to, to start? I think we have one in the chat, uh, Ellen, if I may. Noah, uh, is there a way that you can pick the mic and just uh, elaborate a little bit on your question? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. So the question is, how might we look for a large loop in the connectome, something that has a macroscopic scale uh, in the brain and that gives the network a non-trivial first homology class? It gives us a... Um, a path that um, I, it's uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't uh, doesn't bound a region, you know. Yeah. It's a closed it's a closed path, but it's not the boundary of any region. Yeah, it's a, a little bit like a, perhaps an equivalent of if I understand you correctly, right? Uh, like an equivalent as we can do with some sort of like a path length on the micro scale level, a travel path of communication. Is there also some some things in terms of? Uh, um, uh, in terms of a uh, micro scale organization, and would this lead to combinations, motifs in terms of, of connectivity between homology classes? Is that what you mean? Well, I mean, I'm thinking about something that's kind of metric independent. So, we, we, like, I have a picture of a tree, right? With a root, and it's got branches and all that. But, um, you know, you could imagine that some of those, those leaves, that they're, they're kind of funny leaves, right? And then they, they connect with each other. And so now, um, if, if we go take, say there's two branches at the top level. So you could take the right branch and the left branch and make a loop come, coming back to the, to the root. I think there may be some motivation for looking for these from the point of view of function, in particular, the main disorder, the one that we're, we're suffering from now, the disorder of uh, making infinite use of finite means, the human language problem. Uh, there's some evidence that in newborns, the fiber tract ways don't myelinate between a, a couple of areas that are language active, uh, but they do in like seven-year-olds. And when you myelinate those areas, you seem to get a loop in the fiber tract way, uh, you know, at very high, high resolution, I mean, low, low resolution, big scale. But I wonder if there might be a, a kind of more uh, 
mathematical fancy way using the, the connection matrix to look for these things in a, in a systematic way across species. Because what we'd expect is you wouldn't see it in macaque, you wouldn't see it in other smart animals, but you would see it in this deranged uh, biological experiment of which we're all a part. Yeah. Well, let me let me comment on the first part and then briefly about the second one. The first one, I think I think this is a, a super cool idea. And uh, I think in the field of network science, we have tools for that. We introduced a metric which is called uh, path motifs, uh, which I think is actually quite related to something that you that you propose in terms of of, of circuitry and then link it to um, uh, and, and try to find new sorts of more complex classes. I think that's really cool. The second comment, I, but that's a completely different story. I'm happy to talk to you about this, but I don't think that the human brain is so super special. Uh, obviously it is special, but I think we should also be realistic and, uh, and I'm not sure whether we should put ourselves uh, on top of the hierarchy on everything. So I, I, I don't think that, that we have such a super special brain regions um, that, that with no equivalent found in any other animals, but that's a personal, personal. Let's see, let's see whether, uh, who's right. The, the macaque doesn't have the loop, at least. Uh, no, macaques, but macaques are pretty, uh, in terms of evolutionary tree, they're pretty far away from, uh, from humans. So it's, uh, and, uh, yeah. Other questions? I don't see anybody, anybody uh, raising their hand. But it's hard to check across 55 people on the screen here. While we're waiting, I had uh, one question my, myself, uh, Martin. Um, Martin, how do you relate uh, cortical gradients and information that, you, that are, is being derived from the big brain, things that you've seen from uh, Casey Pacola and, um, and uh, Boris Bernhard, to the underlying network white matter connectivity. Yeah. You have a continuous gradient over the surface. How do you turn that into a parcellation? Maybe I should be asking this question to Casey, but uh, I think it's worthwhile discussing in this broader context. Absolutely. Well, if Casey is Casey's here, right? So uh, please feel free to join uh, the discussion because uh, I, I think I'd, I certainly don't, but I think, I think the field does not have a clear answer on this, but uh, I think, I think they have to be related. I think that's my strongest belief, right? They have to be in some way related. So gradients in terms of one scale should definitely be related to, or start, should define gradients in another scale. And I think uh, the work I, I highlighted from uh, from uh, Klaus, Klaus Hilgetag is something I think the closest, they, they have extensively looked at these gradients uh, a little bit more in a discrete scale uh, because that's the data that is available. But uh, I think the big brain now allows to have like complete gradients or more non-discrete gradients uh, from area to area. And I think it would be extremely interesting to see uh, how that indeed relates or whether there is an equivalent in terms of gradients, in terms of connectivity. So traditionally, I think the connectome field, we have a hard time to deal with um, gradients, right? We want to have our nodes as separate brain regions uh, we allow a little bit, uh, perhaps some some, some uh, fuzzy uh, models of uh, modules, but that's pretty much it. But that also, I think, uh, expresses the limitations of the the connectome model that, or the network model that we uh, that we use to to map the connectome. And uh, uh, I think if we if we show that um, if if with growing evidence of the of these gradients, we also have to in some way incorporate that into our network models. And I guess a related question is uh, the one that comes up all the time, but what is the, the best scale at which to operate when, when uh, taking these connectomics approaches? A hundred brain regions, a thousand brain regions, or a million brain regions? And I'm sure that the first answer that jumps in everybody's mind is, well, it depends on the question. But I'd like to think that there, 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 is, a, there is a space where you can get the most bang for your buck. Yeah. At a, at a particular spatial scale, uh, I'd be interested in your opinion on that. Yeah, I think I think the limitations are uh, at least one thing that we have to consider beyond like here you know, the research question, right? But uh, I agree with you that there should be some sort of a ultimate space, ultimate resolution that we can uh, use for many different questions. So, but I think we do have to take into account the methodology, 
uh, I think, let's be honest, if we use MRI, I, I really don't think that we ever have the res resolution to go beyond 100 to 200 brain regions. So it's simply not what's available. If we use DTI, it's, it's, it's simply not available. Even with fMRI, I, I am a little bit hesitant to go like to, to the super high resolutions. And uh, we have played around with voxel-wise resolutions, which was great at the time. But uh, we also have to be honest about a lot of artifacts, which the network model network. So the graph model doesn't doesn't really deal well with these biases. Uh, and in the last years, we also have clearly seen that uh, biases in network reconstruction, uh, on in particular on the connection level, can have severe consequences when we apply these models to our patient control data, for example. And and this could lead to a lot of false positives and all of these nasty uh, nasty things. So. The methodology, I think, we, we, we need to take in place. But ideally, I think uh, higher, the better higher resolution is better because network models can deal very well with uh, local circuitry, right? If, if the res resolution is super high, but all of these regions are locally mostly locally connected, that's fine. The network model can easily deal with that. So I would argue that uh, uh, I think one of the... One of the uh, very promising approaches is the, the PLI approach, right? The, 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 the polarized light imaging approach, which um, I, I might have missed. It. I might have missed it today, but is there already some indication of using that in big brain? Oh, yes. Um, Katr is uh, Katrin or Timo to speak to the PLI at uh, Ulish? Yeah, Just, that, that is, of course, like the ultimate dream for any connectome. Enthusiast, I would say, right? Yeah. So this is this is this is ongoing and very active work, uh, of course, uh, uh, to include uh, PLI with big brain. Um, but but we are starting with regions of interest because the uh, making a three D reconstruction for the for the PLI is is a very very uh, absolutely yeah, yeah. difficult issue. But, yeah, but yeah, yeah. The, the group of Markus Axa is on it, so I uh, uh, there there will be things coming up soon. Yeah. There is already a, um, a model of the hippocampus, which is close to, to release coming from the Human Brain Project and other works also here in the Highboard Project, of course. We have a question in the chat from uh, Alexandra D'Souza. Alexandra? Oh, well, while she's getting on, I'll ask the question. What are your thoughts on evolutionary developmental hypotheses about how the different scales are linked? For example, the Hain and Cohen cultural recycling hypothesis about yeah. cognition and neuro. I, ha I have to be honored directly from the start here. I, I'm not familiar with the cultural recycling hypothesis. I will, I will Google that. Can anyone fill me up in that one? Alexandra D'Souza? I might have missed that class. Okay, it looks like I'm not the only one, which which made the reuse trends audio problems. All right, so uh, but I, I can I can tell a little bit I think about uh, perhaps in more general. If you fix your audio problem or just type the hypothesis in the in the chat, then uh, then hopefully I can I can answer more specifically. But so I think one of the things that we first have to establish whether all of these cross scale relationships are indeed identical, uh, at least in primate species. Uh, and, 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 or perhaps to what extent they're different. It, it could well be that there is a stronger link between multi-scale in, in high order primates than in low order primates. We, I think we simply don't know. But I think uh, my belief here, my theory would be that uh, they are pretty conserved. Uh, we, we have done a few cross-species uh, cross species investigations comparing mice to macaque and humans, and they're Across the three species, we clearly find the same type of gradients, uh, coexistence of gradients between micro and macro connectivity. So I think, I think this, this is one of those features that are very strongly embedded in the underlying architecture of, of how the brain works, if you will, of how the brain is connected. So I, I think, I think they, they, the gradients sh should be pretty much, uh, pretty much similar to, uh, to a cross species, at least in the, um, uh, at least in the, in the larger animals, often the larger primates. But um, I think uh, in the last uh, two years, we've also uh, got a lot of interest in the allometric scaling uh, principles, right? That's the idea that um, if you look simply at uh, brain volume and, uh, and also the white matter volume, then uh, if you if you scale the brain from, from a smaller, like a macaque to the human brain, then 
uh, it is, uh, I think, a 16 fold or from the chimp, it's a four fold, uh, three to four fold uh, in volume change. Then you would expect that both the gray and the white metal volume would both of them would be four, uh, four times bigger, but that's not the case, right? So some regions tend to scale faster than others. And that's likely, uh, and that's that's very, very consistent across a super large range of species, right? If you take all of the mammalian species, there is a super strong correlation. And one of the things we're, we're getting really interested in to see is the, what are the effects on, on this on connectome structure? Are some of the features that, that we, we, we link up to scale and link up to neuronal architecture, but also link up to disease, then to what extent can these effects be expected? Uh, and, and, and to what extent are they like truly embedded? And, and in that sense are not human unique, but are like something that is that is really consistent uh, across a wide range of species. I'm trying to read the chat. Um, uh, how language, functions like language evolve and then more developmental than evolutionary. Okay, uh, well, Alexandra, I, I would love to talk a little bit more with you about this, so feel free to send me an email uh, and, and to discuss. It sounds I'm gonna I'm gonna Google. I'm gonna make a, a snapshot of your chat, and then I'm gonna Google the the theory. Ho hopefully, I can follow up on this. I guess I would just throw in a, a, a general comment that uh, we do, we have uh, microscopic structures like cortical columns or or visual blobs for a reason. They're on the order of 100,000 neurons in those elements. And I, I don't think the brain comes up with, with that uh, randomly. I think that there's, there's something on the order of 100,000 units, 100,000 neurons, which functions as, as, a, as, a to, as a total unit. And so you may, no, I, gave, I, agree. I gave two examples, but I think, I think that probably applies to the brain as a whole. That's the size of a functional unit in the brain, about one cc. Well, actually, I'm waiting for about five minutes to say exactly what you say, Dana. Yeah. Yes. I think that uh, the optimal way, the optimal scale to study cognition in the human brain is that of cortical columns. And indeed, they are obvious in a primary visual cortex, a, to a lesser extent in auditory, but they are in somatosensory. But the machinery, which means interconnect, local interconnectivity between layers and the tangential to the cortex is there everywhere. Yeah. The scale changes. They are very, this uh, machinery is fine scale in primary sensory areas but it goes all the way to frontal areas, uh, simply it's, it's coarser. So I agree the, the optimal way to study connectivity is that of cortical columns. Right, I, I, there, there, there's, there's two levels here. One is, one is the logistics that, uh, that get in the way of what we'd like to do. And, and Martin correctly pointed out that we can dream all we want, but the machines don't allow us to get the resolution we want. And then there's the, what we think of as the actual biological organization of, at the mesoscopic layer. And if you do the uh, back of the hand calculation, 100,000 neurons occupies about one cubic cc, uh, a cubic um, uh, millimeter, sorry. And uh, if you do that, it, it's, that gives rise to about a million units. So I, I think that in an ideal world, we would be operating on something like a, a million squared sparse matrix. And we're not going to do that anytime soon, understood. But that's how I think the, 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 how the brain has divided itself up. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's a very good point. Uh, I, I think I would, I would definitely test it with people that work on the cellular level, whether they would agree or whether they would argue uh, for even higher resolutions. But I think, I think this is a very good testable hypothesis right and um it would be very interesting to see whether i think the million by million it sounds doable right it sounds way more doable than i think efforts that people do on the cellular level it would be uh, a sparse matrix it would be very of course it would be extremely sparse yeah that's that's the, that's definitely uh definitely the case yeah uh, we could go on all day because this is this is what your talk has, has done martin has generated a tremendous amount of discussion